Welcome to East Town Online. My name is Clint Dupin, and I just want to say I'm so thankful that you are with us today. We're continuing our series in the waiting. We are in week two. We're talking all about peace today. But before I talk about that, I just want to acknowledge a couple things. One of the things that I've been doing uh, with our family is a little book like this. In fact, I read it this morning with our family. It's a very short little read, and it's called Pauses for Advent by Trevor Hudson. Now, uh, we would love to send one of these to you. If you want to simply text East Town to 94000, we would love to send one of those to you. But this is incredible because here's what Christmas is all about. Christmas is, uh, is, is about preparing, right? Advent is about preparing. It's the waiting for something big on the horizon that will actually fulfill us like nothing ever before. And we're in a time, right, when the world is kind of weary, kind of tired. We're looking to something different. This is what Advent is all about. So today as I speak, I'm actually using the, some things here from uh, Trevor Hudson and also Michael Field. Um, just some great pastors, great thinkers and authors uh, to help us with today's uh, service. So I want to ask you a question. What do you think about when you think about peace? What is it that you think about when you think about peace? Because when I think about peace, I think about lack of conflict, right? Harmony, floating down the Truckee River without my kids, right? Or fly fishing in Montana on the Bighorn, right? Maybe avoiding the crowds at Christmas. Oftentimes as a culture, we think of peace, we think about easy, comfortable, and convenient. We think about sitting on the beach, right? Like the commercial, uh, just sipping on a Corona with our feet in the sand. Uh, or maybe sitting on our Amazon app, getting all of our gifts without interacting with anyone. We want the world around us to be lacking conflict and just agree with us. Life should be easy and not stress. Shouldn't be hard, but the reality the last two years, actually the last few years, has not been this, has it? It's been hard. It's been stressful. So my question for you is this. How do you find peace in the world that is not peaceful? How do we find peace in the waiting? So today I wanna to talk about Joseph, Jesus's earthly father, someone we don't often talk about, how Joseph found peace in a world that was anything but peaceful and relaxing or convenient, how he found peace in the waiting. So I wanna read from the book of Matthew when Joseph found out about Mary, his wife's situation, and his soon-to-be wife in Jesus. So let's read from Matthew chapter one. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. So there's some tension in this story. And maybe you've grown up in church, maybe you haven't, maybe you've heard the Christmas stories. Like, we don't really read it with tension, do we? But there is a lot of tension in this moment right here. Mary's pregnant, 
and it's not Joseph's baby, right? This is not relaxing and not comfortable. This was brutal. Joseph's dream of marriage is turning into his worst nightmare. When things should have been so easy, his world is turned upside down. Joseph had lost his peace. So it begs the question, what happens when we lose our peace? So I want to take a look at Joseph and see what he actually does when he loses his peace so we can know what to do when we actually lose our peace. Let's, let's think about Joseph. What do we know about Joseph? Joseph, he's true to the law, isn't he? So he's not trying to marry a person who doesn't follow the law. So he sees that she's pregnant. He knows it's not hers. He's like, I can't do this, right? He, we also know this about Joseph. He was a man of kindness. Didn't want to expose her to public shame. Didn't want Mary to be humiliated. So what does Joseph actually do in this situation when he loses his peace? He starts to problem solve. He wants his peace back, right? A little joke, a little side joke. He's probably a nine on the Enneagram, if you know anything about the Enneagram, right? He immediately tries to change the circumstances that are robbing him of his peace. He is assessing what is robbing me of my peace. So what are the facts that we actually know here? Is that he's engaged, I'm engaged to be married, Mary's pregnant, this is robbing me of my peace, we will no longer be engaged. So what do you do? What do we do when we lose our peace? Do we immediately try to change and control our circumstances? I would say for me and most likely you, we immediately try and problem solve. Do we try to change our circumstances in order to find peace, right? So let me give you some examples like, this marriage isn't peaceful, I'm ditching this one for a new one. My career isn't peaceful, I'm ditching it. This friendship isn't peaceful. I will just go with a different one or cancel this one. This home isn't peaceful. I will just numb out on Netflix or maybe even over drink. But then we find ourselves, right? Maybe for some of ourselves as we escape, we find ourselves on that beach and attempt to get away, thinking that that Corona commercial with Snoop Dogg with his feet in the sand was actually a lie because we still feel this unrest inside. Now, just a caveat before we keep going, I wanna say this, there are some situations that we do need to escape from, but that's not necessarily what we're talking about today. And the truth is, I want people to understand that we can't, I want you to hear this, that we can't find the peace that we are looking for in the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Let me say that again. We can't find the peace that we are looking for in the circumstances we find ourselves in. I, I can't find the peace I am looking for by getting me out of this one and getting into a new one, right? The truth is solving circumstantial problems will never lead to the peace that we so deeply desire. Why? Because we cannot possibly solve every circumstantial problem that arises. Look at the past few years. It can't be done. Things outside of our control, our circumstances kept happening to us and there was nothing we can do. The amount of uncertainty, of loss, lack of justice has been vast. I don't know about you, but I still try to find peace in my circumstances. I try to find it on my own, right? My own strength and control. It's a little, it's a, like a futile pursuit, isn't it? It's, it's like me at night going back to that empty snack cabinet over and over and over again, expecting something to be different, but it's just not. I wish I had uh, this illustration in person, but maybe you remember this at a carnival or you, at Chuck E. Cheese, right? You remember whack-a-mole? Right? This is what trying to find our peace is like. It's like playing the game of whack-a-mole. Trying to find our peace is like this whole idea. You have these little plastic moles right, that pop up and you have this mallet and you're trying to hit every one of these moles. And every time you hit one, another one comes up, like our circumstances. Now, maybe you've actually been to a carnival and you size up your competition when you're doing it, like in, in, you're competing against others, right? And you think, I'm the oldest here. This might have happened to me. I'm the oldest here. I'm the fastest here. 
I'm going to take home the biggest stuff prize that will fall apart on the way home and comes with a case of tuberculosis, right? Only to find out that the youngest kid there wins. It's like this. We think we are better at whack-a-mole than we really are. We think that we are better at solving our problems than we really are. The thing is, our problems will just keep popping up. They will just keep appearing. We're obsessed over finding peace, but we can't possibly solve all of these problems. And I think it does this. I think it reveals a truth. Could it be that God uses our lack of peace to get our attention? That's tough, isn't it? Could it be that God is using these circumstances, this lack of peace in our life to actually get our attention? Could it be that he allows these circumstances to happen in our lives that cause us to stop and actually look up and ask God, what in the heck, what in the world is going on? Because I don't know about you, but I often look for peace in my circumstances more than I look for peace in God. Are you looking to your circumstances to be your savior? more than you're looking to Jesus this Christmas. I, I would even ask that of myself, am I looking to my circumstances to be my savior? Then I'm looking to Jesus this Christmas. Wouldn't this be a great thing to acknowledge this Christmas? Maybe, maybe that's your thing right now. Wouldn't this change everything? Could it be that we have only experienced kind of the shadow of Christmas rather than what Christmas is actually about? I beg you to ask this question, wherever you are, maybe you're driving down the road right now, you're sitting in your living room, I don't know where you are, but ask yourself this question, how many times have you got to the other end, the other side of Christmas, and you feel just as empty as you did before? What's your response? How do you feel? What's that connection feel like? The other truth that we see here the other truth that we get from the story of Joseph is this. Your lack of peace is often the precursor to God's greatest work, right? Isn't that crazy? Your lack of peace is often the precursor to God's greatest work. Isn't it crazy? Joseph found himself in the most unsettling circumstances he could ever imagine, and little did he know the Messiah he had been waiting for his entire life was coming through his lack of peace that came into his life. God's purpose and plans often come through these unsettling seasons. His peace doesn't come through changing your circumstances. His peace comes through the midst of your circumstances. We have to stop playing whack-a-mole with our lives and start trying to understand what God might be trying to do in our lives. One of the things you will often hear us say here at Easttown is you can never underestimate the amount of pain represented in a room. Now, I would say this as well about peace. As you're watching or as people will hear this weekend, right, in person, in this room, this size, I can't imagine the lack of peace that is represented with you, maybe your finances, your kids, your relationships, whatever it might be. And the hard truth is that God is not a genie, right? He is not at our beck and call. He's not there to grant us whatever wish that we want. When we want our peace to come back, he might not change that difficult circumstance in our lives. He might change it. He might not change it. And, and maybe your temptation in that moment or even now is to believe he is not that good not that loving, not that powerful. Here is what we often see in this moment. Our pursuit of God stops and the pursuit to change our circumstances increase. We end up accepting peace on our terms instead of God's terms. Haven't we seen this? I've watched this with so many people, even just over the past four years here at Easttown, the little time that we've had as, as a little church, a little community is, you can tell people you can't find your peace in that, but eventually you see a drift that begins to happen and there's this pursuit to find peace in my circumstance and it just doesn't work. So my questions, 
Two questions. Where have you been trying to find peace? Ask yourself that. And the second one is this. What circumstances have you been trying to change? What circumstances have you been trying to change? Man, maybe today is that day that you really, really investigate those two questions, right? Those two right there. Remember, your lack of peace is often the precursor to God's greatest work. So how do we find this peace? Actually, this story right here gives us an indicator on how to find that peace. Look at what it says in verse 20. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. What truth just screams out to us right there? The truth, peace is is the absence of fear. Peace is the absence of fear. The first thing that the angel says to Joseph is not to be afraid. Afraid of what? To stay in the situation that is currently robbing him of his peace. Do not be afraid to lean into this reality. I'm telling you this, I'm telling myself this, because wherever you are, I am. This is what God is saying. Whatever circumstance you find yourself, I am there. Jesus is saying, I have plans for you in this situation. The root of our lack of peace truly is fear. Fear is the enemy of peace, which also means that bad circumstances are not the enemy of peace. The angel is letting Joseph know that these circumstances are not about to change. She's still pregnant and the baby isn't yours and you are going to take her home. The circumstances are not going to change. The circumstances are not your enemy. This is important. The angel is saying, God is near, Joseph. God is near you. God is in this. God is going to use these circumstances to change the course of human history And if you are not afraid, you can be a part of it. This phrase, do not be afraid, is not a suggestion. It is actually a command and is actually used 365 times in scripture. It's like you have one per day for the year, right? It is a preamble to a command. It is a, it is this situation was do not be in this particular situation is do not be afraid to take Mary home. I want you to apply this as you are sitting there with me right now. I want you to apply this, whatever your name is, maybe Judy you're watching or John or Carrie or, or Cynthia. I don't know. It's like, apply this. Clint, Judy, Carrie, do not be afraid of and fill in the blank with your circumstance. What is that circumstance you're going through right now? Think about how many of us have our identity in something external? Think about when a circumstance or a situation comes along and harms, destroys, alters that thing we have put our identity in. This is why peace cannot come, it's so good, peace cannot come from something external, but only internal. When we put our identity, our truth in Jesus, nothing can rob us of our peace. No external situation can remove our peace. We can live open-handed. We can be untethered to anything in this world. Now, I wanna give us some statements that remind us of how much we put our eggs, right? Our stock, our hope in these baskets. I want this to be a reminder to not put them there. The first one is this, you will not find peace in your circumstances. You will not find peace in the way you thought things should go. You will not find peace in your life turning out how you thought it should go. You will not find peace in your life looking beautiful. You will not find peace in everything going as it should go or shouldn't go. Wow. Do not fear change. Do not fear pain. Followers of Jesus find their peace in Christ and in him alone. The Bible reminds us of this quite a bit, that our lives are like a mist. 
So therefore, we do not tie ourselves to the things in this life. This is why Jesus walked so freely. It wasn't easy. He walked so freely to the cross, right? Even in the face of death, he was able to experience peace. I want us to understand this definition of peace. It might be hard to accept, I realize that there is so much fear around this, right? For many of us and people we know, our fears have been realized over this past few years. I think the main reason that you might struggle with this definition of peace is that it declares that we, that you, are not in control. That's hard. This requires deep trust in who? God. It requires that we are in relationship, that I don't get to dictate what happens in my dating life, what happens with my kids, where my career goes or doesn't go, right? This past week, I love, you know, we watch football at our house and we were watching this NFL game and it came down to a field goal at the very last two or three seconds of field goal. And it was about a 35 uh, yard kick and the kicker missed it. Somebody in the room, maybe it was me, said, you literally have one job. Like your only job is to kick that ball through those uprights, that's it. Like you get paid a lot of money, you just have one job. I feel like God is saying that to me. Clint, you have one job. Just lean into this command every day of your life. Fear not in every circumstance, do not fear. What would it look like to obey the command, do not be afraid in your life? The question is this, where is he inviting you to receive his peace? So this leads us to the last thing, and it's a little bit more practical. How do we practice peace? Well, look here in verse 24. Um, and where do we find Joseph? Right here. Uh, this is where we can find this peace right here. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. Can you imagine if Joseph had this insane experience with an angel and laid it all out, but just didn't do it? I, I, I think about this, right? I think about the times when God asked me to do things and it is a moving experience where God speaks to me and I get this peace, but I just don't do it. This isn't Joseph. He does exactly what God asked him to do, and his circumstances actually get worse in so many ways. All of his circumstances would actually scream a lack of peace. Mary getting pregnant, right? The woman in this type of culture and the judgment that, and criticism that must have ensued, lack of peace. Him and Mary becoming fugitives, as we know in the story, lack of peace. Nowhere for his son to have a place to be born, lack of peace. His son having political and religious leaders threatening his life, lack of peace. His son being condemned, tortured, beaten, and murdered, lack of peace. Everything points to that Joseph's peace did not come from those circumstances. His peace came from God and what God told him to do. His circumstances got worse, but his peace remained. Here, here is the hard truth, right? Full peace comes from obeying God. Let me say that, say that again, our full peace comes from obeying God. Jesus is our full peace, who made everything wrong right on the cross, who justifies us on the cross. This is the gospel. Justice is our sins being punished and him taking the punishment on the cross. Because of his sacrifice, we are made right before the Father. He is literally our peace because of his justifying work on the cross. Listen to this. We practice this peace of Jesus that we have inherited through obedience. It is nothing we have done. We practice this peace by the way we live our lives. When we don't live a life of obedience, our lives don't agree with what Christ has actually done for us. 
right? It just goes against the grain. It's like an out of tune instrument in an orchestra. Everything else is great, right? But it's just that one thing you just can't get past. I remember playing the saxophone in the eighth grade and there was probably 60, 65 people in the band. And we were playing this song and I remember the, the, the uh, conductor, the band, whatever, he just stopped and he was kind of this rough guy and he just pointed at me and this, these are the words they said and he's like, what the hell are you playing? And I was just sitting there, I remember it was a traumatic moment in my life, but he could hear one person out of 65 that was playing something just a little bit off. That's what disobedience is. It's everything else is in sync or in tune, right? But just that one thing. We find peace in our quiet time, but chaos in our relationships because we didn't do what God asked us to do in that relationship. Peace isn't just in our hearts and minds. It's in our bodies. It's holistic. Doing what God told you to do will often put you in circumstances that are less chaotic, but more chaotic. But when we trust and obey God, he will reign in that chaos. Doing what God told you to do might not lead you to becoming highly successful or influential. Like look at Joseph. He basically fades out of the story. We hear about his mother and other family members, but not Joseph. But his obedience ushered in the Messiah that they all had been waiting for. His obedience didn't just bring peace for him, but those around him. Could it be that the more obedient we are to God, the more peace those have around us? And I think about all the stories I see here at Easttown. I think about our global partners of these heroes of mine that are sacrificing on a daily basis for people to have clean water, to have access to clean water, sharing the gospel. I think about uh, Vanessa at Love Never Fails, who kind of goes unnoticed, but is rescuing people, has sacrificed her corporate career, right? She is one of the unsung heroes, and her circumstances aren't great, but she's finding peace and power because of what God is doing in and throughout her life. God has a calling on your life. He has an assignment for your life. You need to know that at the end of the day, at the end of your life, you will not find the peace you are looking for if you don't understand the assignment and the call on your life and walk obediently in it. What our life looks like is up to God. We have one responsibility, do not fear, listen and obey. I wanna ask you to consider these two last questions. I presented them earlier, is this, where have you been trying to find peace? And what circumstances have you been trying to change? God, we just come to you, and Lord, in the waiting, we wanna experience your peace. In the waiting, we wanna start assessing those circumstances that are around us, understanding that we can't find the peace um, in those circumstances, we can only lean into the promise that you are with us, that you are standing by us, that you are the one that gives us that ultimate peace. And Lord, maybe for some of us, we've been waiting for that. And today might be the day where we accept that truth, that because you chose to take the burden of our sins away, that you choose us, that we can trust you in our circumstances in your name. Amen. Hey, it was great being with you today. I'm excited about next week. You're not going to want to miss next week. We will see you for week three of In the Waiting.
never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let Never gonna let me Oh, God.